The CSDB logo with a collage of nine videos in the background zooms out and fades to a solid white background. Title, Interventions for Autism Spectrum Disorder with Children Who Are Deaf, Hard of Hearing. Deborah Mood, PhD, Licensed Psychologist. Part 1. A split screen shows a sign language interpreter on the left, and on the right our presenter Deborah Mood is sitting in front of a solid background. Captions are below on screen. So today we're going to be broadly talking about what interventions are available for treating symptoms of an autism spectrum disorder. These are interventions that are generally described as having some evidence base within the general population. And we'll talk about how, what considerations might be for autism interventions, specifically with children who are deaf and hard of hearing. But my hope today is to give the audience um, an understanding of interventions that were specifically developed for autism, that uh, many of which show promise for being modified for use with children who are deaf and hard of hearing. In a future broadcast, we'll be talking more specifically at educational interventions um, for children who are deaf and hard of hearing with an autism spectrum disorder, but our goal today is to provide a more broad-based understanding of what autism intervention in a comprehensive sense can look like. And the reason I'm talking about how, um, autism intervention, not just autism intervention as it happens in the school environment, is that according to the, Nation the National Research Council, in 2001, they published guidelines called Educating Children with Autism. And those guidelines indicate that autism intervention should begin as soon as autism is suspected, not even just after the diagnosis is received, because we know, especially for kids who are deaf and hard of hearing, that sometimes that diagnosis is prolonged. Um, but that the intervention should also be of a certain amount of intensity to show impact. The guidelines indicate that autism intervention should be a minimum of 20 to 25 hours per week of autism-specific intervention. Now this, I want to be clear about this, that this does not mean that the child has to have 20 to 25 hours a week one-on-one -on -one with an interventionist. The guidelines are intended to encapsulate the intervention that the child receives at school as well as interventions that they receive from private providers, as well as the interventions that families are doing, um, taking all the, the strategies that they've learned from uh, um, that work well for their child with autism at home. So what's intended here is for there to be a very comprehensive, um, multi-tiered intensity around intervention both school, from both school providers as well as in the home and from community-based providers. It's helpful for individuals in schools to know what these other interventions are so that you can work collaboratively with the child's other providers. And so my intention today is to outline what some of those interventions are so that everybody has an understanding of what's available for autism intervention um, and so that you can work and have a shared language around providers outside of the school setting. Um, the guidelines also indicate that interventions should be individualized. Because children with autism have certain core symptoms, many of which present differently from child to child, it's really important that the intervention not just be a packaged intervention, but that it be one that's tailored to the unique needs of the child that it be systematic, that there's a plan and an intention around um, that intervention programming, and that it's developmentally appropriate. Um, so the interventions that are appropriate for older children are likely to look quite a bit different than the interventions for younger children. There's, um, it's important that intervention target the core symptoms that we know are associated with an autism spectrum disorder. So, communication, social communication across a variety of different settings, their cognitive development, play skills, and proactively um, addressing challenging behaviors. It's important that the intervention have a piece of collaboration with highly trained professionals who have some understanding of an autism spectrum disorder and autism intervention. 
And this is going to require quite a bit of collaboration, especially for kids who are deaf and hard of hearing who also have an autism spectrum disorder. So collaborating between professionals who um, know and understand the deafness and between providers who understand autism and autism intervention. In most places in the country, unfortunately, there are a few providers who know both, so that collaborative piece is really important. The good news is that what we know is that the evidence is starting to show us that this systematic intensity around intervention can change the course of those core deficits and those core difficulties um, associated with autism. We're still learning about who benefits most from what type of intervention, um, and there's a long way to go in that regard, but it's positive to know that a lot of kids um, benefit from these types of interventions. Um, one of the things that's really important to know about intervention for autism is that there's no medication that's been demonstrated to have an impact on those core symptoms of autism in terms of um, the social difficulties, the social communication deficits, and the repetitive behaviors and restricted interests. Medications are sometimes used to address some of the associated difficulties like sleep difficulties, um, gastrointestinal symptoms, seizures, and some behavioral difficulties, but the medications have not um, at this point been demonstrated to be effective in addressing those core symptoms. The other thing that's important to know is that there are many different interventions that have shown some, prov some promise in terms of effectiveness. And so uh, um, what works for one child may not necessarily work for another, but there are some that have shown to have more of an evidence-based practice than others. What's important is that you think through the intervention, what are the symptoms that, are trying, that you're trying to be addressed, and making sure that you select the intervention that's tailored to address those specific areas of difficulty. Um, as a result, the, um, we're starting to see with this highly individualized systematic intervention, starting to see changes in terms of um, higher cognitive skills among individuals who have received um, autism intervention, better language skills, improved social skills, and families are less stressed and happier if their child is receiving the supports that they need. So these are results that have been demonstrated with hearing children with an autism spectrum disorder, but we have no reason to think <laughs> that if we're able to provide effective interventions for kids who are deaf and hard of hearing, I would assume the same outcomes for them until somebody shows me evidence to the contrary. The good news is we've moved away from um, things like IQ as an outcome measure of showing whether an intervention is working or not because um, for families and for individuals, um, whether or not a child's IQ was um, increased as a result of intervention didn't necessarily play out in terms of what was important for the quality of life for that child. So we're starting to look more towards, are we seeing improvements in those core difficulties of autism? Their eye contact, their social communication, their ability to have and sustain friendships. Um, and also, what's their quality of life? <laughs> um, are, is the individual demonstrating a, a, a a quality of life that's satisfying to them? Um, are they able to seek and obtain and um, hold a, a job? Um, those kinds of things. And so in thinking about what interventions that we're selecting for kids with an autism spectrum disorder, we need to think about what's the long-term goal and outcome that we're looking at and make sure that we're selecting an intervention that's gonna help us reach that goal. I'm going to describe several different types of interventions that have um, been shown to have some degree of effectiveness with hearing children with an autism spectrum disorder. Again, with the goal to make you all aware that these interventions are available and to think through um, how they may be applied for children who are deaf and hard of hearing. Um, many of you may have students in your class who are getting outside intervention um, and knowing what that intervention is targeting could be helpful in using some of the same strategies in your classroom or in your home. 
So uh, again, the interventions that I'm going to be discussing, each has a different theoretical approach and targets very specific behaviors and symptoms of autism. So you need to make sure that you're thinking about why you're selecting an intervention before you choose one. Um, and again, you want to make sure that you're selecting an intervention that targets the um, symptom of autism that's relevant to the child and that's appropriate for the child's level of development. Um, to make sure that, to increase your likelihood that the intervention will be effective. Um, please refer to the links in the description of the video below for information about um, resources where you can see information about the interventions that I'll be describing and where you can see videos that show some clips of the interventions. So the first one that I'll refer you to is the National Professional Development Center on Autism Spectrum Disorders. This is a site that reviews evidence-based practices in autism that's helpful to make sure that you're selecting an intervention that shows some evidence-based promise. The next reference is from the Autism Speaks website and in their descriptions they provide a in their website, they provide a um, description that's more comprehensive about the interventions that I'm describing here. And in some cases, they also have videos where you can see clips of the interventions so that you can compare what they look like. Again, these um, are resources for children who are hearing, who don't necessarily have reduced hearing. But ideally, you'll be able to think through applying the interventions to kids who are deaf and hard of hearing. Probably the most commonly based, uh, the most commonly cited intervention, um, and the one that shows the strongest evidence-based effectiveness for treating symptoms of autism is something called applied behavioral analysis. Or you might have heard that as um, you might have heard of that before as ABA. ABA is um, a way to apply the concepts that we know about learning and motivation that stems from behavior analysis to uh, um, teach proactively positive skills. In this case, the skills that we're talking about are those um, social communication skills and positive behavioral skills. So the idea is to consider what is the behavior that you're trying to see increase. So for example, in treating an autism spectrum disorder, that might be increasing eye contact or increasing the amount of the frequency with which the child um, initiates play with peers or their ability to take turns in a conversation. Um, and ABA um, does a very good job of encouraging individuals to explicitly identify what is the behavior that you're trying to increase and then to think through what happens before and after that behavior to make it more likely that you'll see those positive behaviors. So an example of that would be um, in teaching eye contact, I might change what happens before I ask for eye contact from the child by getting down at the child's level. So I've changed the antecedent right, to make it more likely that I'm going to get eye contact from the child. And then I might get down low and say, look, or Johnny, or make a fun noise. And when I get eye contact, I might give the child the toy. And that's the consequence, the, the um, reinforcing the act of looking, the behavior that I was targeting. So that's a simplistic way of talking about what ABA looks like. But usually when you work with a ABA, um, somebody who's practicing ABA, they'll identify several different goals that you'll work on in a very systematic manner. Um, ABA also is helpful in addressing problematic behaviors. So it works in targeting positive behaviors that you want to see increase, as well as using similar principles to decrease those challenging behaviors. Um, challenging behaviors in autism might be anything from um, self-injurious behavior where a child is hitting themselves or biting themselves to um, outbursts in the classroom. Um, so you would use these principles to address those behaviors. This can take 
um, many different forms. So um, in the early studies, we talked a lot about something called discrete trial training. Um, some of you may have heard of the LOVAS technique, where this was done in a highly structured manner, where you might say, um, Johnny smile when Johnny smiled. You reinforce that with an external reinforcer, like a piece of candy. The, there are other models of ABA, or many of the models that we'll talk, the interventions that we'll talk about today incorporate aspects of ABA and integrate it in a way that um, focuses more on generalizing behaviors across different settings and to different providers. Um, again, um, ABA is something that was developed for use with children who are hearing, but the, the principles of ABA are certainly things that can be applied to children who are deaf and hard of hearing. One of the approaches that's commonly talked about in and used in schools is often referred to as the TEACH approach. Um, this actually is called the perceptual cognitive approach because the model was based on the idea that children with autism have differences with their cognition their and their perceptual and sensory systems. So TEACH really addresses those aspects of trying to make the classroom environment or the home environment something that the child with autism can understand. So it builds in lots of organization, lots of structure, lots of routines, a lot of visual supports, um, so that it provides the infrastructure to help the child who has autism be able to participate and manage the cognitive aspects of the test that are challenging for them. Um, in the description of the in the description of this video, you'll see links to um, a, you'll see links to a video that will show you some of the different aspects of the teach model and what they can look like in the classroom. Many of you might be familiar with things like having, um, entering a classroom that uses teach principles that has um, like study carols or very specific workstations. That comes from the teach model. Or um, work baskets so that the child knows um, what they have to do and when it's finished. If the work is completed in the work basket, that's a very concrete way of letting the child with autism know that the task is completed, um, which is very important for children with autism. So you'll see some links to videos in in the description of this video that show you in a, I don't know, that show, give you examples of what this model looks like. I'm gonna talk now about several uh, models of autism intervention, many of which also incorporate aspects of ABA that we've already talked about and even some of which incorporate aspects of that TEACH model. Um, the, the unifying aspect of these models is that they're considered developmental models because they emphasize intervention that takes place in the child's natural settings as opposed to a clinic space where they use materials that are commonly available to the child in their home and in their school environment. That they, the, um, the models emphasize interaction versus the child just being able to do something in isolation. And again, many of them incorporate those aspects of ABA, like systematically thinking through reinforcement for the child. Another aspect that's true of these models is that they capitalize on the child's in interest um, to use first starting from a place where you can recognize what the child is interested in and using that as an opportunity to build on learning very specific skills related to the areas of difficulty um, that they have. So for example, this might be if you notice that a child is really drawn to musical toys, using music um, with their parents and teachers to teach them uh, attending skills or staying in circle time. Um, and using the reinforcing and motivating nature of those activities and interests to make it more likely that the child will be engaged in learning these new skills. Another thing that these developmental models have in common is the use of something called high affect. And by high affect, I mean um, using a lot of your 
intonation, your body language, um, your kind of spirited affect <laughs> to try to cook and catch the child's attention. So, um, children with autism have been shown to not necessarily attend to faces the way that typically developing children do. And, but what ha the research has shown is that if we bring up the affect and the energy level, it can um, mark yourself as something that stands apart from every other face and every other individual and capture the child's interest and their attention. One of these models is called Pivotal Response Treatment, or PRT. This was developed by um, Dr. Robert Kogel and Dr. Lynn Kogel. It's a play-based model, which was a change from some of the earlier intervention models, uh, sorry, from some of the earlier autism intervention models. It also is a change because it's child-driven. So the idea is, again, to start with what the child is showing you that they're interested in and using that to build communication skills, positive social behaviors, um, and to address any negative self-stimulatory behaviors that the child has. Um, pivotal response treatment is based on the principles that there are certain areas of development that are really critical, that serve as a foundation for um, building every other skill. And um, for the developers of this model, those include making sure that you've captured the child's motivation, um, making sure that the child is able to be self-regulated, um, making sure that the child is able to initiate social interactions, and making sure that they're able to respond to multiple cues in um, different aspects of their environment. Um, Unlike some of the earlier um, ABA models that use external reinforcers, like giving a child a token or a piece of candy when they demonstrated a positive skill like eye contact or saying a word, um, the developers of this model really emphasize natural reinforcement. So um, Instead of reinforcing a child with um, a piece of candy, if they said car, um, in pivotal response treatment, you might find something that the child likes, like cars, using that thing that's intr intrinsically motivating to them, setting up a play opportunity with the child, and maybe withholding the car <laughs> until they make an approximation like or say car or sign car, and then giving them the car. So giving them that natural reinforcement um, through your affect as well as the object that they're requesting, as opposed to some unrelated reinforcer like a piece of candy. One of the models um, that's been developed for young children with an autism spectrum disorder that has shown a lot of evidence-based promise is called Early Start Denver Model. This was developed by Sally Rogers and Geraldine Dawson and their colleagues. And it's called Early Start Denver Model because it actually started here in Colorado as the Denver model and then was expanded upon and modified. Um, and this is an approach that's appropriate for young children with autism who are ages 12 to 48 months. This is a developmental model, so again, it takes into account those aspects of what's motivating to the child, natural reinforcers, um, and happens in naturalistic settings like the, the child's home, um, and also integrates ABA principles. Um, what's nice about this model is that it's very comprehensive and developmentally focused. It's based on the idea that um, Children who have autism often have splintered, scattered, uh, splintered developmental skills. And if we don't address those areas uh, that they haven't yet acquired, that it makes it more difficult for them to acquire um, later developmental skills and move um, forward. And so um, the model, uh, whereas some of the models might emphasize just on the development of um, language skills, this one emphasizes language, fine motor skills, gross motor skills, play skills, and all of the autism um, related, all of the 
of the aspects that we know can be challenging for children with autism, like in imitation, um, turn taking, those kinds of skills. In the resource guide at the end of this presentation, you'll also see some references for this particular model. One of them, um, an early start for your child with autism is a really nice parent manual that teaches how do we build social routines for our child within the context of our lives. So it's very practical, um, very easy to understand, and really relays the concepts of the model in a very um, family-friendly manner. You'll also see links to videos where you can see what this intervention looks like. This is an intervention that is being applied clinically with um, young children who have reduced hearing. We just don't have the research yet to know um, how, how to best modify the model for children, um, especially for children who communicate using the sign language. But the principles of the model are certainly applicable um, and have shown some, um, on a case study basis, have shown some promise for use with young children who are deaf and hard of hearing. I want to touch very quickly um, so that you're aware of these interventions. There's another um, intervention targeting um, young children with autism spectrum disorders called LEAP, which is short for, it's an acronym for Learning Experiences, an alternative program for preschoolers and their parents. <laughs> um, this is an another model that actually comes out of Colorado. And um, it's a preschool-based curriculum um, where the teachers are trained how to work on things like peer-mediated social skills, encouraging children to help reinforce um, the child um, with autism and their social skill development. Um, it includes how do we capitalize on incidental teaching moments. Um, it also includes how do we support behavior in the classroom. So this is a nice model to look at if you're looking for an educational model for young children with autism. Another educational model that has been developed um, by Barry Prezant and Amy Weatherby and Emily Rubin and Amy Laurent is called the CERTS model, which is an acronym for the aspects um, or the symptoms of autism that this model really targets, which is social communication, that's the SC, um, emotional regulation, which is the ER, and transactional supports for children and older individuals with autism spectrum disorders. So this is a model that can be applied across the age span. It is a very um, interdisciplinary approach where the intention is to um, complete an evaluation about the child's needs at, from an interdisciplinary perspective and then to implement supports um, across disciplines uh, within the school setting to help target those very specific aspects um, that we know can be challenging for children with autism. The resource guide at the end of this presentation will also include a link to resources on this model. Now I'd like to shift a little and talk about um, some interventions to specifically target the um, speech and language skills of children with autism. In the literature of autism intervention for children who are deaf and hard of hearing, um, there are very few articles <laughs> that are available that have looked at this. Um, one of the only ones, one of the few out there, is one that has looked at using this strategy of an intervention called Picture Exchange Communication System, or PECS to build language skills for a child who's deaf who also had autism. And this particular intervention was based on very um, operant and condition-based um, philosophies about how language is acquired um, and uses um, visuals like the picture that you see here. Picture, an image of a card labeled with the word sit, accompanied by a line drawing of a school-aged male sitting in a chair. 
to um, teach a child systematically how to initiate communication with others. So initially, the, um, the child might take the picture that represents the thing that they want. It's the next level of abstraction. Photographs. One photo shows a young boy outside holding a communication card. A second photo shows the child handing the card to a woman. To give the card in place of a spoken word or a sign, to give the card to an adult or another peer in exchange for the thing that they really want. That's the first step of this. This was intended to be used with children who are not being su successful initially with either using spoken language or sign language as an abstract means of representing what they really want. Photograph. A young boy is sitting at a table in front of a red communication board. A second image of a card labeled candy is accompanied by a line drawing of a clear plastic bag full of candy. So the visual card makes that much more concrete and ideally would make it um, more obvious to the child to be able to use that to communicate with others. That then gets reinforced by the person who's receiving the card by giving them what they asked for. Um, and then the child is starting to learn to recognize, oh, communicating with other people has value. Um, so, using the cards to build that motivation for engaging with other individuals in their environment. Um, the, the PEC strategy um, is very systematic and um, at the resource guide it will explain what the different stages are of using this as a strategy to build more and more language use. So you start first at the single word level with perhaps very concrete pictures of um, the objects that the child is requesting and use it primarily for requesting. And then you build upon that to communicate, not just requests, but also commenting and also sharing information. Um, and then going also beyond the single word, the single word level to um, using those um, pictures to communicate increasingly complex grammatical features. Photograph. A rectangular piece of cardboard is fitted with a strip of Velcro holding two picture communication cards labeled I want and ball. Like using sentences like I want and then ball or I want and then snack. Title. Interventions for Autism Spectrum Disorder with Children Who Are Deaf, Hard of Hearing. Deborah Moon, PhD, Licensed Psychologist, Part 1. This has been a production of CSDB Outreach Programs. Logo. Excellence in Service, Colorado School for the Deaf and the Blind, established 1874. Learning, Thriving, Leading. 33 North Institute Street, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 80903. Telephone 719-578-2100. www.csdb.org.